So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Lauren Clark. And Dr. Clark is a professor of medical genetics at the University of British Columbia. He's been in the, the field of lysosomal storage diseases for more than 25 years and published many, many papers and uh, served as an MPS1 PI. He's known to our Canadian families and our U.S. families, a great friend of the society, and we welcome him. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. And it's, um, it's great to be here and to, uh, to meet old families that I've known for close to 30 years as well as to... Uh, to meet some new families. So today I, I've been asked to give an overview of the muc mucopolysaccharidoses, and uh, I was asked to add a science twist, and I'm also gonna be somewhat controversial, and you're gonna hear probably concepts that you, uh, that you have not heard previously. I have standard disclosures. Um, I, I was in this, this area long before there were any biotechnology companies involved, and it's, uh, it's really exciting now to, uh, to actually see that we can put uh, disclosure slides up, that there's people involved who are making therapeutics and making the next generation of therapeutics. So let me start with the take-home messages that I would like you to take home. Um, um, uh, there'll be many areas of this talk, but there's certain things that I'd like you to leave with and, and have you think about over the next uh, a couple of years. It's clear that the mucopolysaccharidoses are, are multi-system progressive genetic disorders. Um, the other important concept, as you'll see as you meet many families over the next couple of days, is there's, there's considerable what we call clinical heterogeneity, meaning Almost every single child who has a particular mucopolysaccharidosis diagnosis has their own personal uh, natural history and has their own personal medical problems. And that's very important to realize, that unlike other genetic disorders that are relatively homogeneous and we can predict natural history accurately, that is not the case for the mucopolysaccharidoses. And in fact, I would put out there that understanding why one patient progresses so rapidly, and one patient progresses so slowly, there's clues there for therapeutics. Because if we could understand the pathways that are different and the physiology that is different between an attenuated MPS1 patient and a severe MPS1 patient, there's potential therapies there. And that's the, that's the case for almost every mucopolysaccharidosis. So understanding what drives that difference of clinical features is important. The other concept, which is probably against what you've heard, is that the MPSs and mucolipidoses, I will state emphatically, are not storage disorders. And, and I'll go into why, why that's important. And one of the, one of the key reasons why, that, why that's important is that the progressive symptoms that patients have are not related to progressive storage. So even though we've classified these in the past as storage disorders, we were actually incorrect. Um, the primary block is storage, but actually the symptoms that patients have in the progression of disease is not related to progressive storage. There is one lysosomal disorder that is a, that is a true storage disorder, and that's Gaucher disease. And what's interesting is Gaucher disease is basically almost cured by enzyme replacement therapy because enzyme replacement is great for storage, but it's not great for the other complexities of disease. And, and this is what I'm going to get into a little bit more today. The other important take-home message that I'd like you to take home, because I think when you're thinking about funding research and, and funding lar uh, um, um, increasing understanding of these disorders, we still have a very poor understanding of the disease pathogenesis. Now, some of you may be surprised to hear that. We know all the genes that are, that are involved, we know all the enzymes that are involved, but we still do not have a clear idea or a clear picture of how those deficiencies lead to the particular symptoms that, that individual patients with, M with MPS have. One of the other important take-home messages is timing is everything for these disorders. The outcome for patients is directly related to how early a diagnosis is made and how early intervention uh, is started. So clinical heterogeneity. Here's a perfect example of uh, a number of Canadian as well as US patients with, um, with MPS6. They all have the same diagnosis, but look at the different 
disease burden they have and the different natural history of disease that they have. And as I scroll through these pictures, these are all pictures of MPS1 patients who all have the same diagnosis but clearly have very different natural history of disease and very different um, uh, uh, cl uh, clinical features. So this is what we mean in clinical medicine uh, as clinical heterogeneity. And that's really important for you to realize that even though your family member or yourself may be diagnosed with MPS4A or Morchio, almost every patient is going to be a unique natural history and a unique physiology and, and, and biochemistry. We know that, that these disorders are what we call multi-system. Basically, you pick your organ system and there is an effect that every single MPS has on that organ system. Some are more important for others and some are less important. So the spinal cord is involved in, in, a, in a large number of the mucopolysaccharidoses. The heart is involved in virtually all of the mucopolysaccharidoses, although in some it's more rapidly progressive than in others. We know that, that hernias, ophthalmologic involvement with corneal involvement and retinal involvement, again, is present in almost all of the, of the mucopolysaccharidoses, but to a different extent and a different uh, a natural progression. What is unique amongst all of the mucopolysaccharidoses is the involvement of the skeleton and the joints. And at the end of this talk, I'll, I'll highlight research that you guys have funded, as well as the Canadian MPS Society has funded, in understanding the complexity of, of the bone and joint disease. There's also, uh, in virtually all of the MPSs, very complex airway disease, both upper airway disease, uh, as well as primary lung disease, uh, as well. We've known for quite some time, I entered this field in the 1980s while uh, the, the genes were being isolated and enzymes were being isolated. We know now of all the enzyme deficiencies that are responsible for the mucopolysaccharidoses and mucolipidoses. We know that there is storage of GAGs, and that's how we kind of incorrectly initially categorize these as storage disorders, but it still remains a puzzle of what exactly are the drivers of the skeletal disease, the connective tissue disease, the neurological disease, and the gastrointestinal disease. So I know that's surprising for some of you to hear, but that is the state in 2019, is that we still do not have a clear understanding of what drives the symptoms that patients have. So we classify these disorders in relation to the enzyme that's deficient, and so there's different classifications and there's eponyms named after some of the clinicians and clinician scientists that, that first discovered these disorders. We know the glycosaminoglycans that are stored in the, in the different conditions and we know the enzymes. But this is a very superficial categorization of, of these particular disorders, but they are important from a genetics and an, and an, inherit, and an inheritance perspective. What's also really important to realize is that glycosaminoglycans are very complicated molecules. So this is not like measuring a blood sugar or a cholesterol level. Glycosaminoglycans are very long chain polymers of sugars. They're anywhere from 75 units long to hundreds of units long. And there's numerous modifications of these particular sugar molecules which, which allow them to function. Almost all of cells in our body require glycosaminoglycans in order to function normally. All of our hormones, uh, all of the receptors that we have at, cell, at the cell surface require glycosaminoglycans in order to, to function properly. So cells communicating to each other, cells responding to hormones, cells responding to what we call humoral factors require glycosaminoglycans to, to, be, to be at the cell surface. They're constantly made and they're constantly recycled. We don't take them in in our diet. We actually, we actually break down gags in, in our intestine to the individual sugars, and then our body makes these up. And we have to have glycosaminoglycans present in order for our, for our cells to, uh, to function normally. So they're a very important component of almost every cellular pathway. And, and this is the, uh, the reason why there's so much complexity to the clinical symptoms that patients have, is that you're bunging up a system that is really important for cellular metabolism. 
So we know that heparin sulfate is really important in connective tissue. Heparin sulfate is also a very important component of structural proteins in the brain. How neurons talk to each other, how electrical signal, uh, signals get transported uh, along neurons require glycaminoglycans associated with what we call proteoglycans or certain proteins. All cell receptors, so every um, neurotransmitter that transmits connections between one neuron and another requires glycaminoglycans in order to mo modulate that signaling. Dermatem sulfate we know is important in connective tissue and extracellular matrix. So the stuff that holds your skin together, the stuff that holds your bones together, um, the stuff that gives your organs its structure is made up of, of, of dermatem sulfate. Chondroitin sulfate is also a component of connective tissue, as well as keratin sulfate. In fact, they put keratin sulfate in, uh, uh, in shampoo, thinking that it's going to help the luster of your hair. Um, but the, it's a key component of, of, of your extracellular matrix. So you can begin to now understand why these disorders are so complicated, because you're, you're wrecking a, a group of molecules that are very important for cellular function. So we know that the primary block in all of these disorders is how our body degrades glycaminoglycans. So these things need to be recycled because our cells are changing constantly, our organs are changing con constantly. And th this recycling happens in the lysosome. Now, I hate when people call the lysosome the garbage factory or the garbage can of the cells because the lysosome is actually a central component of metabolism. And uh, this is from one of Steve Walkley's uh, articles, and the National MPS Society has funded a lot, of, a lot of research through Steve Walkley's lab. And basically, the lysosome is at the center of, of metabolism of most cells. So it's not the garbage can of cells. Yes, material is recycled in the lysosome, but almost every protein that has to be targeted to the cell surface, meaning receptors, and molecules at the cell surface that allow cells to talk to each other, actually are targeted through the lysosome, and the lysosome is part of that targeting mechanism. So you can now begin to understand how, if you have something that's accumulating in the lysosome, how it's more than just the accumulation of that particular substance in the lysosome that is likely driving the symptoms the patients have. So what we now understand, or at least theorize, is going on with respect to these disorders are, are what we call pathogenic cascades. What, what this means is that, yes, the primary block is in glycosaminoglycan catabolism, and these molecules are accumulating in the lysosome, but they're now affecting the function of that particular important uh, machinery of, of the cell. And it's likely that secondary effects of now lysosomal dysfunction, or the inability of the lysosome to function normally, that is likely the mediator of symptoms. And I'll show you some, ex some examples of that. And what's also really important is that these complex cascades are actually established very early in the natural history of disease. And in fact, there's evidence from some model systems now that some of these changes already begin in utero. We also now are beginning to understand that some of these changes may not be reversible. Um, and, and that's a really key component with respect to the development of new forms of therapy, as well as understanding the limitations of therapies that have, have, that have been developed. It's not that the therapies aren't good, it's that the initiation of these events has, has happened and you now can't reverse that event. And you can think of many different uh, medical conditions where that's the case. Once your cholesterol has been elevated for an extremely long period of time and you have atherosclerotic lesions of your coronary arteries, well, you can reduce your cholesterol as much as you can. You're still not going to unplug those arteries that have been blocked. Well, it's, it's sort of similar in the mucopolysaccharidosis. So what do we mean by, by pathogenic cascades? Um, and, and I'll just give a really quick example of a, of a, of a, of a cartoon of pathogenic cascades. Your 12-year-old is, uh, uh, is taking a bath and leaves the water running um, in, uh, in, in the bathtub upstairs. The bath slowly starts to fill up with water while your daughter is texting all her friends from her bedroom. And uh, th uh, that texting is going to go on for hours. And the water starts to spill now on, on, onto the, uh, the bathroom floor. 
those beautiful Brazilian floor tiles that you put on, the wood tiles are now beginning to warp because the floor is filling up with water. The, uh, the water is now seeping into the floor vents that, uh, the, uh, that are in your, uh, your bathroom and uh, now leaking down to the main floor uh, of your house and soaking the, um, the, the, uh, the ceiling of, um, of your kitchen, which then collapses. A fire then starts on the stove because you had already started dinner for the kids. And uh, the fire then leaps from your kitchen into your neighbor's house and uh, sets fire to your neighbor's garage. And your, 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 your neighbor's vintage 68 Mustang that he has had there for a long period of time blows up throwing a flaming shrapnel into the neighborhood and cuts out the electricity in 50,000 homes in the, uh, uh, in the area. That's a cascade. So now when you think of lysosomal disorders and storage of glycemia-glycans, you can see how simplistic the, uh, and why um, there's problems with this very simplistic model. It's a unidimensional model. It would mean that if you relieve the storage, you would relieve the symptoms. Well, when you think about this model of the bath filling up, relieving the storage would mean going upstairs and turning off the water. When you turn the water off or you drain the sink, there's still 50,000 homes that don't have electricity. You've still burnt half your house down and the neighbor's garage, and he's lost his Mustang. That's irreversible. Well, this is now what we feel is going on with, like, with, uh, with, um, with these disorders. So when you think of therapy, early storage timing is then critical. Turning off the water is not going to be enough to stop the events that have already happened. But if you stop the water before the water has been leaking onto the kitchen floor and started those cascades, you have a much, much better chance of having a, of having a positive outcome. So this is now how we need to think uh, uh, about these disorders. So what are the examples do, uh, uh, that we have? Uh, um, uh, am I just making this up? And the answer is no, I'm not making this up. Progressive joint disease is an integral uh, component of all of the mucopolysaccharidoses. Uh, just look around uh, the audience. There's no evidence that there's progressive gag storage in the bones and joints of individuals with mucopolysaccharidosis. We know this from human studies that we've done, and we now know this from animal studies that have been done. We now know that the progressive arthropathy, or the progressive joint disease, resembles the progressive joint disease that we see in other forms of arthritis, like inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis. So there's fibrosis. When, when we look at tissues that are taken out of, of children and adults at surgery, there's not a lot of gag storage. There's fibrosis, there's cartilage proliferation, there's inflammation, and there's cartilage destruction. And we know this now from MPS1 models, 2 models, uh, um, as, as well as um, the MPS7 model that has been around for a long period of time. So with funding that's been provided by the National MPS Society to Leela Simonaro and Kathy Ponders, and to my group at the Canadian, from the Canadian MPS Society, what, what, we, what, we, what these labs have been able to show is that the alteration in the bones and joints is not gag storage. There's activation, uh, Lila Simonaro's group has shown very compelling evidence of activation of what we call toll-like four receptors. These are important receptors that are activated in osteoarthritis. We also have found alterations of your extracellular matrix. All of the proteins that have to transit the lysosome to get to the extracellular matrix to make your bones and joints normal function are, are, are already abnormal. And so now we understand that the progressive joint disease is this complex biomechanical failure model. There's early alterations of the extracellular matrix which may be established in utero while the baby's developing in mom. That, that is really a developmental problem, like we see with other skeletal dysplasias. Then as you use that joint, like osteoarthritis, you begin to damage the joint more, and you, and you then activate what we call inflammatory cascades. And then you end up with this circular argument, or, or this circular uh, cas cascade. You can see how adding enzyme at a later stage of this cascade is not going to reverse some of the symptoms. Let me end with the brain. We know that the brain is also a very significant 
uh, area of, of morbidity for a large number of, of MPS patients. What's also interesting about the, about the model systems as well as human studies is that there's not a lot of gag storage in the brain. In fact, there's very small amounts of gag storage. But the, the gag that is stored is highly toxic to the function of the lysosome. So there's, and there's also no evidence of progressive gag storage, meaning that a one-month-old mouse with MPS1 does not have any more gag in their brain than a 12-month-old mouse with MPS1, despite the fact that they have progressive symptoms. And it's the same with the dog model, it's the same with all of the other models. And so we know that direct gag uh, storage um, is not the, the, the primary event. So again, with funding provided by the National MPS Society to Steve Walkley's group, and as well as others now, they've been able to show, uh, uh, this, this is a, a, a color photo, the green dots are glycosaminoglycan storage in neurons, and the red dots are what we call um, a, a gangliocide storage. There's no defect of gangliocide metabolism in mucopolysaccharidoses, but there's massive accumulation of gangliocides in the brain of all of the models, uh, the MPS models that have been looked at. Gangliocides are what accumulate in patients that have Tay-Sachs disease, um, another totally unrelated genetic disorder that leads to severe central nervous system disease. And not only GM1 and GM2, but all of the gangliocides are increased in the mucopolysaccharidoses uh, in the brain. That may actually be more of the mediator of the symptoms, the progressive symptoms. The other storage is a sterified cholesterol. So uh, the, uh, the, picture, the picture on your right is a neuron just ram-packed with a sterified cholesterol, which is basically a hallmark of, of a totally different disorder called neiman pick c uh, that has progressive central nervous system dysfunction. But this is in a brain of a model of, of mucopolysaccharidosis. And Liz Neufeld's group, again with funding by the National MPS Society as well as NIH, has been able to show that some of the progressive neurological disease in the San Filippo mouse model is related to storage of P-tau protein. Well, P-tau protein is the most important protein that is stored in Alzheimer's disease. Again, showing a link between the neuropathology or the progressive neurological disease in mucopolysaccharidosis and San Filippo and um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Not primary gag storage, but alteration of how the lysosome functions and how the neuron functions with a lysosome that has problems. So let me just conclude that uh, we're all very excited about the advancements that are being made in the development and, and, and uh, implication of therapeutics for both uh, the MPSs and, uh, and mucolipidoses. And I think we need to understand the limitations of some of these therapies based now on this more complex understanding of, of disease pathogenesis. And, and I think we shouldn't be frustrated by the lack of response to some of the symptoms. I think we need to make sure that we learn from our experiences to try to develop the, the next form of therapies. It, it's um, also really important for us to take into account the pathogenesis of these disorders now as we understand them into evaluating therapeutic outcomes. Meaning, if we have all these cascades that are activated, we have to realize that the timing of initiation of therapy and, the, and where in the natural history of disease an individual uh, enters a clinical trial may very much influence their outcome. You, you may develop a very good therapy for the disorder, but you've applied it too late in the pathogenic cascade. So th 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 that needs to be uh, accounted for. But I also would, uh, w would put forth uh, the, the importance of continuing to fund research that leads to a better understanding of disease pathophysiology. It's often very easy to say, no, I'm only going to fund research that is directly related to a therapy. But you can, you can now see how it's important to, to actually understand how, what are the factors that are involved with disease progression? What are the factors that are involved with generating the symptoms in patients have? Because marrying those with the therapeutic is going to be the most, the, the, the most powerful mix. So thanks very much for your attention. And I'm going to be around for most of the day, and I'm ha happy to talk to anyone.